We are beginning a new series uh, on purpose. I just want to thank the worship team for getting up really early and, uh, and for picking great songs that just lead us to, uh, to sing our faith and to ground us again in, in these realities. So thank you so much, the worship team. Yeah, you can clap. I, I would clap. Yes, thank you, guys. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt said this, it's not the critic who counts. Not the man or woman who, you know, points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man or woman who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at worst, if he fails at least fails while daring greatly. I love that quote. It makes me want to throw my fist in the air like Rocky Balboa in the Rocky movies, but I like it more because it points to the fact that it's easy to be critical from the sidelines of others. It's a totally different thing to actually be the person who's living a life of significance in the grind of the day-to-day realities in the world. And it reminds me of the way that the Bible speaks about the life of faith, that it's not just a private, inward sort of focused spirituality. No, it's a vibrant way of life. It's put into practice in every sphere of our existence. It's working out what Jesus has called us to in the trenches of everyday life. And that, that takes bravery. Yes, following Jesus in the real world will call for real Courage, daring, it's, and it's daring greatly because it's following Jesus, the great one who calls us to great things. James puts it like this. He says, don't merely listen to the word. The word is referring to all that God has said to us and called us to through the work of his son Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it is says, deceive yourselves. That's strong language, isn't it? But he's basically saying this. If you listen to God's word and you say thanks and then you just carry on with life as usual, you are lying to yourself, he says. You're, you're deceived. No, he says. This is, this is what the life of faith is about. It's hearing and then responding in trust and getting on with doing the things God made us to do. That is real life. And so as we begin our series I want us to focus in on what courageous faith, like being about God's business in the real world, is really all about. But let's just start with some of the problems to begin. See, there's uh, much of the purposelessness that people can experience in our world today, and there's a lot of that. It's really from the denial that there is any grand story that would make sense of our smaller stories. Uh, it's, this idea is there because it's a denial that there is a storyteller, someone who is writing throughout the course of history his good plans. So if there's no God in the picture, or at least not a God who's actually active in the world, uh, then there's no one to define what life is really about. The secular age that we live in, it exerts a sort of pressure on us, and the underlying assumption is that, well, there is no maker, and so if you're going to find purpose in life, you're going to have to make it yourself. So really, there are stories being told, and stories that we buy into, but they're, 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 they're squeezed, and they're thin stories. So here's what happens in our secular age. We, in the late modern West, experience the pressure of meaning making on our own terms. One philosopher calls it the terror of history. It's like knowing that history is going nowhere and then trying to find meaning in that. The terror of history. We we live primarily in the late modern West under the sway of the capitalist story. And this smaller story says this, you are what you own. Therefore, you find meaning, you find identity in life through what you have. It's through where you live, like what neighborhood your house is in, uh, what you drive, what brand of clothes you wear, and to some extent, how happy and well-adjusted you look or your family looks, and how you stack up to those around you, 
how well adjusted they look. So in this story, you work hard, you get the right job, you find the right spouse, you buy the right stuff, you take the right trips, and then somehow, meaning. Now, the other word for this is the American dream, just if you hadn't figured that out yet. Um, so meaning, but is it meaning? Well, there's another story that exerts influence on us too, but we're probably not as aware of it. It's the Marxist story. It's especially attractive to people who can see through the empty promise of the capitalist one. The Marxist story says, no, you're not what you own, you are what you do. What you accomplish. Your identity and worth are based on what you create and what you contribute. And you know, that actually becomes a powerful story, I think, in our midst as well. It actually sounds quite attractive because I'm in control of whether or not my life means something in that sense. However, however, you have to keep striving for that significance. Because if your sense of value is based on your accomplishments, you're going to have to keep accomplishing. And you have to accomplish more and more to know that you have value. So ultimately, both of these stories are, are actually very bad news. They're bad news because we are at the center of our own lives. And you imagine that that's not just bad news for you, it's bad news for your society too. If every single person is living self-centeredly, just for themselves at the center, that's not going to be good for your neighbor, is it? They're also bad news, and maybe mostly so, because they're untrue. They'll never deliver on the promises that are made. The Christian story, however, and thank God, stands to critique and correct all other stories, all other ways of narrating the world. It unmasks these views. It speaks of our meaning and our identity completely differently. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of philosophy right off the bat, but here's why you need to see this. This is actually really, really important um, because the pressure you're facing today is going to relate to those stories. You will be tempted to view your life and its meaning based on what you own or what you accomplish. Think of it. If you're a stay-at-home parent, um, in this world we live in, in a culture that says meaning comes from what you own or what you accomplish, your calling to raise kids, to raise them to be whole, to raise them to love God and to love others, man, it'll be easy to feel like that's just not significant, that it's not honorable in our world. You may feel a sense of pressure even to make more money for your family so you can participate more wholly in the capitalist story or to accomplish something that's seen as being worthwhile in our world. Or perhaps you are working full time, but you feel the same pressures. Why? You don't want to be left behind by your peers who are taking all the warm vacations, who are driving the new car, who are advancing in their careers. So, you know, there's this phrase in the sociology literature right now that's often applied to our young adults. It's the fear of not being amazing. And I actually think that's true not only for our young adults, but just for our world in general, that we feel like unless we're amazing, unless we're performing to a certain standard, boy, we, we feel like we look small, insignificant, like our lives aren't worth something. So there's a pressure there to create meaning and purpose by working harder, being more successful, seeking recognition, and always being amazing at it. See, both of those stories, and many others that are like them, drive us into purpose-seeking. That's really just a cycle of grief. I've put that on your outline, but I'm skipping over it for the interest of time today. It's good stuff that you can read it on your handout. But these stories are both false and ultimately destructive, and you and I need to be free of them. But how? Well, we're going to listen to how Paul tells the Christian story and how it calls us to a life of true significance this morning. Let's pray as we begin. Living God, as we sang this morning, we pray that you would open us up to hear your living word this morning, that we might be shaped and changed by the power of the Holy Spirit as we encounter you today. Speak, O oh Lord. We want to hear you. We want to respond. Amen. Now, one of the key verses for the whole series that we're doing is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And, and uh, it, it says this, For we are God's handiwork. Now, that could also be um, translated God's accomplishment. We are what God accomplishes. Beautiful, isn't it? Or we are God's work of art or his masterpiece. 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. I hope you will memorize this verse. Actually, you'll notice in your study guides as you read through them that there are memory verses for the next five weeks. I know we don't usually memorize verses as adults, but I think it's such a good idea. Our kid, we memorize them with our kids for Awana, so I thought, why don't we just do that with all our adults too? So I hope you'll memorize this verse. It comes up in week two, but more. I hope you internalize it. I hope you let this rattle around in your brain and in your heart. But even more than that this morning, we need to see that this is set within the bigger story of what God is doing. And that's what Paul writes about this morning. So we're going to see Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 as it's often called the greatest summary of the gospel that Paul wrote. He lays out in this section, you'll see these great contrasts between death and life. See, if, if, if you want to know what your life is for, what your purpose is, we actually need to step back and see first our true condition, second, God's great love and grace, and then third, at that point, we'll be released for our purposes within God's design. So first, let's open up in your Bibles. I hope you have your paper ones here. If you don't, you can find a Bible app or something, or it'll be on the screen. But uh, love you to bring your paper Bibles too. I think those are great. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. Paul begins, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. Now, the ways of the world are that system that sets itself up against God's ways, that are living in opposition to God's ways. The capitalist story, the Marxist story I just narrated, that's the world, as though God's not in the picture. You used to follow the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. It's talking about God's enemy that's actually at work in hearts. Well, that doesn't sound like very good news at all, does it? Paul goes on, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh. That's our selfish nature that sets itself up against God as our king. And, and what does that really lead to? He says this, following its desires and thoughts like the rest, the rest of humanity, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Boy, that sounds like it's getting worse, not better. But we need to see this. Paul is being honest about the true condition of humanity before a perfect and holy God. And we need to know it. Why? Because the good news will just seem okay to us until we know what Jesus really went through for us. See, if we think that we're only marginally in need of just a little tune-up, you know, no one's perfect, everyone makes mistakes. Yeah, that's true. That's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul's talking about how sin vandalizes God's shalom. That God made the world out of love and our rebellion against God actually tears down. It defaces what he made and loves. In our self-centeredness, our sin, boy, that is different from just making mistakes because it's actually making ourselves little gods in God's place. It leads to exploitation and violence. It leads to pain in our world. It leads to dehumanizing others and in the process dehumanizing ourselves. And Paul introduces a word here that may, maybe makes us a little bit uncomfortable. He uses the word wrath. And he says that we're deserving of it to boot. But what does that mean? Well, wrath, God's wrath, is his settled opposition and action against anything that distorts or destroys what he made and loves. And that just makes sense. See, God made all that exists, and he loves it. And he loves the human creatures he made in his own image. And now, could we really say that God is good if he wasn't upset about, angry about even, when people vandalize his good creation and each other, even ourselves? See, I wouldn't be a good dad. We, we played some shinny hockey, some uh, pond hockey with our kids uh, over, over the Christmas break. And now, if one of my kids took their hockey stick like this to the other, if I just thought, oh, that's interesting, let's see what happens, I wouldn't be a good dad, would I? I? I actually wouldn't. If I didn't step in and say, stop, don't, 
You're hurting your brother. You're going to be in calm down corner for like now until I don't even know when you go back to school. You know, if I don't jump in and intervene, I'm not a good dad. I'm terribly negligent. When we speak of God, well, let me put it this way. Um, Becky Pippert, in, in a book called Re- Hope Has Its Reasons, she, she argues, I think really uh, truthfully, that um, hate isn't the opposite of love. Apathy is. I, don't, I just don't care. If God didn't care about the vandalism of shalom, he would be an unloving God. And so God does step in. That's God's wrath. So Paul here, he says, all of us have contributed to the vandalism of God's good world. We've stepped outside the bounds of what God made us for and we tried to run things on our terms. So Paul says the true condition when we do that is that we are dead spiritually. We're disconnected from the living God who gives us life, from relationship with him. And to our point this morning, we can't live the life we're made for until that changes, not ultimately. But the good news is that it can change. See, that's not where our story ends. The good news comes in Paul's next words, even next word. Verse four begins, but. Paul says, yes, that's where you come from, but it's not the whole story. It's not the end of your story. It's not even the center point of your story, but. But. German theologian Karl Barth argued that but is the most important theological word in the whole Bible for this reason. Paul says, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but it's a shift. It it tells us that's not where the story goes. Isn't that good news? But what? But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. But is the great contrast. It's the hope I need and you do too. We're not saved because we're good or or do enough good to somehow make up for all our bad. No, we're saved not because we're good, but because God is. That's grace. And here's what we need to see. Paul's point is not only to show our true condition, but to focus our hearts on the extravagant love of God. Two things we need to see. Uh, your English Bibles don't pull it out very well. The preaching professors tell us don't use a ton of Greek on stage on Sunday mornings. I disagree. So uh, here we go. Verses one to seven are one ridiculously long run-on sentence. Here's what that means. It means you don't really get to the point of the sentence until you get to the end of the sentence. Paul's not done yet. So his focus on verses one to three on our true condition are really important, but Paul's not done. He's got more to say. And and the focus we find out, what Paul wants us, our hearts to explode with thanksgiving for is, at the end of verse seven, the incomparably rich, the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. The structure of the text draws our eyes and our hearts to the overwhelming, never-ending, extravagant, beyond words to describe love of God for you. That's where this sentence ends. Second thing. Uh, In the original Greek, Paul puts the word, but God, right at the beginning. Now, you don't have exclamation points in Greek. What you do to add emphasis is put a word right at the beginning of the sentence. So when Paul wants to focus our attention, he's going to front a word, and he fronts the word God. Here's my very wooden translation of verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, through his great love by which he loved us, even when we were dead in sin. Notice God is at the front of the phrase. And notice too, love is repeated. You might not see that in your translation. First as a noun, then as a verb. The love with which he loved us. It's like really redundant writing, but there's a point to it. The first is the noun. This is the affection God has for you. His love for you, but then it doesn't end at a feeling or an affection. It goes to an action. God's love for you by which he loved you. Namely, he gave his son Jesus, God himself, who wins us back through his life, death, and resurrection. 
Now, here's why this is so important for us to see. One person put it like this. Have I skipped my notes? No, I haven't. Here we go. We're on track. This is good. Uh, when I recognize the bigness of my need for God's grace, the significance of my sin, just how far gone I was, only then will I recognize how far God went to win me back. Only then do I know the bigness of God's grace. And then when I see the bigness of God's grace, my response is going to be big love for him because I recognize just how far he went. And my big love for him is going to get expressed in big service to others. And when I get this, I can never say to God, hey God, you're okay. I guess the whole cross thing is kind of cool. I might even give you a bit of my, emphasis on my, like not recognizing that everything we have is actually from God. I might even give you some of my time or money or energy once in a while. See, our response to God will correlate with what we believe is true about God's love for us. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the great preachers of the 20th century, he puts it like this. Imagine a friend tells you, hey, I, I paid a bill for you. So how do you respond to that? Well, you don't really know how to respond unless you know, like, what bill it was, okay? So maybe you left your garbage can on the side of the road and the bylaw came and ticketed you and it was like 25 bucks. So you'd say, man, I owe you one. That was awesome. You shake his hand. He says, oh, no big deal. Okay, 25 bucks, no big deal. Imagine we lived in the States and that you had a very ill child and you've got a creditor who's pursuing you because you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical expenses that you can't pay and your friend says, hey, I paid your bill for you. How do you respond to that? Here's what Lloyd-Jones says. Until you know how much he paid, you don't know whether to shake his hand or fall down and kiss his feet. The reality is, and this is what Paul's getting at, Jesus has literally taken hell for you and me. He's experienced the pain of separation from the Father so that you and I will never have to. For a time, he did. He experienced true and utter darkness for a time so that we can live in God's light and love forever. In Christ, God himself takes the consequence of human rebellion, death itself, into himself so that we can be transferred from living a life under the sway of God's enemy to life under, under the loving leadership of Jesus. And that, if we get it, will humble us into the ground because it tells us just how far God had to go to win us back. And it lifts us to the sky at the same time because he wanted to do it. He chose it for you out of love for you. Charles Spurgeon, 19th century preacher, says, if you're not humbled in the presence of Jesus, you don't know him. You were so lost that nothing could save you but the sacrifice of God's only begotten son. And then Spurgeon notes the only reasonable response. As Jesus stooped for you, bow at humility, in humility at his feet. A realization of Christ's amazing love has a greater tendency to humble us than even a consciousness of our own guilt. Pride cannot live beneath the cross, so let us sit here and learn our lesson. And then let us rise and carry it into practice. Bow humbly at his feet. Yes, receive his grace and his love. Just revel in it. Truly humbled by his love. And then let us rise and put it into practice. That is the whole foundation for what we're going to talk about over the next five weeks. It's living on purpose. If you don't understand all of what I just said, the, the rest of it's not really going to make a ton of sense to you. That's why I wanted to start here. So let's look at what it means to live on purpose now. Verses 8 to 10. For it is by grace that you've been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's a gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So this is the first point, is that we are freed to live on purpose by grace. Paul says it yet again. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. Notice, you are not saved by your faith. Your faith does not save you. God's grace saves you. Your faith is how you access that grace. Faith means trust. So our faith doesn't save us. No, God's grace does. How we appropriate God's grace, how we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus is when we say, I put my trust wholly and totally on your finished work, your completed action for me, Jesus, your death and resurrection, I trust in that. That is my hope. So faith is our response 
to God's grace, which is what saves us. And you need to see this today for two points. If you haven't received God's grace, you can today. Praise the Lord. Someone responded in the first service and said, I put my trust in Jesus. They came and told us afterwards. Maybe that's you too. Maybe you've said, I'm not so sure. I don't know if I'm really going to put my life in his hands. But that's your only hope for life, for freedom from the coming judgment of God and for becoming who you were made to be. And two, if you have trusted Jesus, you are now truly free to get on with being who he's called you to be. You might be living in fear. You might be living in in a sense of guilt. This tells you that you are free in him. So you can get on with it. That's what makes this next piece so key. Being brought from death to life in Christ is not by works so that no one can boast. And see, this is really practical. This is the perspective we gain. Being saved by grace frees us from ever feeling that God owes me. and, And that releases me to serve God joyfully, regardless of whether my work is painful and difficult or if it's easy. It frees me from an emotional roller coaster of wondering if I've, if I've done enough now for God to approve of me. No, we're already approved by God when we put our trust in his grace. It also frees us from comparing ourselves to others. It enables us just to get on with responding to that grace, never needing to make a show of it. See, applying that grace, the finished work of Jesus, it takes away our ability to say, well, I really am just superior in what I'm doing over so-and-so because, like, like, look at me. Look at what I'm doing. God is obviously going to be super pleased about all my goodness. That is, that's not something possible to say if you understand the gospel. And here's what we need to see next. Two, we are freed to live on purpose in community. Now, we tend to think about purpose pardon me, in very individualistic terms, don't we? What's God's plan for my life? Now, that is an important question. It's not a bad question. But living under the pull of a highly individualistic culture, we can begin to misapply our faith and purpose when I have I at the center of the question rather than we as God's people. The gospel, the good news, does not mean Salvation in an isolated or private sense. Salvation in the Bible is always forgiveness of individuals, personal, it's always personal, but then it's never private. It's about the restoration of all of creation and our social relations too. It means the formation of us as the people of God together that we form a beautiful picture. In the next section, actually, if, if you go on to read, Paul's big point there is that we are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. See, being God's handiwork, uh, you might not like this, it's not actually a reference to you or me. It's plural. It is true on a personal level, and we'll talk about that more next week, but we have to pay attention to what Paul actually says. For we are God's handiwork. We, together, are God's work of art. We are fashioned together to be about God's work in the world as a team, a unit, a community. I love that. Because the work God is calling us to takes all of us pulling together. Uh, In the Vision 2021 plan that I shared this November, we laid out what we believe God is, is leading us into. And that includes actually beginning a third service. That'll happen like to plan another congregation on Sunday night starting in September. Boy, we want to reach our city. We want to reach beyond that with the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus. And so we need to create space for more people to belong in community, for them to grow in Christ and us to grow together. But this will take all of us using our gifts, not just in this setting, but in our work, in our neighborhoods, in our schools. God has called us to love our neighbor, to care for the poor, to share this good news all the way around the world, and we need each other for that. And that is God's work that he's accomplishing with us. That's our last point. We are free to do God's good work in God's good world. God's creative purposes, forming us into his new creation people, isn't just because God wanted to make this like beautiful work of art and then put it on exhibition on a shelf somewhere. 
We are created in Christ Jesus to be co-creators, to participate with God in the healing of the world. And I think that's so exciting. Good works. That's our new creation task. Do, do you get that new creation piece? We are God's new creation and we participate in the new creative work in our world. That's beautiful, isn't it? John Stott says it well. Good works are indispensable to salvation. Not as its ground or means, but as its consequence and evidence. Don't misunderstand. Paul has been clear that salvation is totally a work of God so that no one can boast. You and I did nothing to, to deserve or earn God's favor toward us. We never could. So the work here has nothing to do with salvation, but the good works. God, in his sheer grace, enabling us to be about his business in the world in response to his love, that is truly the consequence and evidence of our salvation. It's not the grounds, it's not the basis, but it is the result. I see many of you who are so caught up in this reality. You are just joyfully giving of yourself in response and love for God by loving others around you. Keep giving yourself to doing that. I mean, I go to the bar, same barber each time, and, and when I do, I have the pleasure of hearing about how God is at work in her life when I sit in that chair. See, she was not so long ago uh, living apart from God, living with addictions, and if you asked her, she would say living in chaos too. But as she came to experience the grace of God through Jesus, and, and, and with the support of her church community, sh her life shifted completely. Now she owns a business, and she uses that business as a platform to provide a great service to our city, to be a great employer to a number of staff, and to care for those in our city who have less. See, she uses her business to actually fund caring for the poor of our city in many different ways. She started a ministry in her church just to care for single moms from her neighborhood. And it's been growing and expanding, and she's actually like using the money, much of it, what she earns, to, to help support uh, those women in need. As I look at her life, it's this beautiful reflection of what happens when the gospel gets a hold of someone, when Jesus gets a hold of a life created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us together to do. So I ask, how are you responding to his grace? The lavish love of God for you. Are you living on purpose? Or are you just kind of getting pulled along by the sway of the stories that are out there? Are you about God's business in the world? As, as we move to the table now, and I'm, I'm gonna invite those who are serving with me to come forward, let's respond with thanksgiving to God's lavish love. Perhaps this is a time where, in addition to giving thanks to Jesus and what he's done for you, maybe this is a chance for you to renew your commitment to living on purpose. This table, the bread that symbolizes Jesus' body that was broken for us, and the cup, which represent his blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. This story of how God has loved us, this is now my story. And if you've put your trust in Jesus, this is your story too. This is the story that shapes all of your life from here on out. This is what defines us. And so as we participate, we're taking that into us and saying, yes, this is my story. This is what I'm for. This is the God I love because he's first loved me. Let's pray. Living God, we thank you that you created us and now have bought us back from the power of sin and death so that we could truly participate in life to work with you in the healing of the world. We give thanks that you did everything necessary to save us through your death and resurrection, Jesus. And now by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us live with the joy that gives. Amen. Uh, if, if you have put your trust in Jesus, then this is for you to participate in. Um, it's our practice to just hold the elements until everyone has received it, and then we take it together. It's a symbol of our unity in Christ, that we're one body. We're taking it together. Uh, if you haven't yet put your trust in Jesus, my question would be, why not today? Why not come home? God is waiting for you to come home. Maybe you take this today as your action of putting your faith in the lavish grace of God toward you.